by time but um it's uh, it's it's great to have you with us great to have opportunity to hear again a bit more from genesis i believe yes great thank you yes genesis chapter three i'm going to jump over the uh, um creation of the woman and we'll come back to that at a future point isn't it lovely how the lord takes a word that uh, graham spoke uh, yesterday on his uh, devotional and it the Lord speaks and it echoes in the hearts of his people this morning and uh, very beautiful I I'm I, I was struck by what um, Bev was saying about the first word he Jesus said to that man was son and I was uh, I heard a story just a few weeks ago from about from a missionary who um, adopted a, a girl uh, who was living in a, I don't know which country it was, but he was uh, adopted this girl and uh, the, the girl was uh, quite uh, traumatized by things that had gone on in her life before. And uh, she couldn't say, she never called him dad. It was a long, long time before she called him dad and it really broke his heart. He longed to hear her say dad. And, um, then one day she came in, she got her shoe damaged and uh, she needed it all just repairing. And she came up to him and said, Dad, can you repair my, my shoe? <laughs> and, uh, he didn't show it to her, but it was like, <gasps> <laughs> he would have bought her a whole shoe shop. That's what he said. <laughs> Doing anything because it just so blessed him to hear her say that to him. And uh, I say that because when when he calls us son or daughter it blesses us and we're adopted in his family and then there comes a day when we say abba father and uh, that just melts his heart so if you want to know how to melt god's heart just go and call him father um so genesis chapter three we're as i said we're moving on because i will come back to chapter two at uh, the end of chapter two another time but in chapter three we come to this rather dark chapter. It's uh, the chapter of the, the what is often called uh, by people the fall of man and uh, the, the, uh, the fall of Adam. And uh, the Bible never calls it that actually, but I think it's fairly accurate. Uh, we, we speak of the fall of Satan. Uh, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall. And uh, I think we can quite accurately speak of the fall of of, of mankind here in this chapter. Let's read some verses. I only want to read a few verses. Now, the serpent was more clever. He was cleverer than any animal of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, he only said 44 words in English. I counted them this morning probably less in Hebrew, but 44 words in English. He said, first of all, he said, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not touch it, nor shall you, sorry, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. That was a slight exaggeration. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And that completes the 44 words that he spoke. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was uh, for appetite and that it for taste and it was pleasant to the eyes, it was beautiful. And a tree desired, desirable to make one clever, get really good marks in exams, <laughs> uh, make you really clever. She took of its fruit and ate. No one forced her. Nobody was pushing it into her mouth. Sometimes when our children were really small, they wouldn't eat. They'd clamp their mouth shut. Mm, 
and we try and force it in very, very hard. And we try all kinds of methods like an aeroplane bombing mm, to trick them into opening their mouths. But um, very hard when somebody doesn't want to eat something. And, uh, but she wasn't forced, she ate. She also gave to her husband who was with her. And we assume he was with her throughout the whole previous verses, the whole conversation. And he ate. Then the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they made themselves coverings and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the spirit of the day. The word cool is the Hebrew word ruach, spirit of the day, the spirit of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And God said, Who told you that? Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, and the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And then the conversation goes on down and uh, then God begins to speak first to, to, the, to the serpent and then to the woman and then to the man in that, um, is it in that order, yes. Mm. Um, and uh, it goes on. We'll look at that a little bit another time. But so we begin with this, this section with the serpent. That's the, the phrase in verse 3, now the serpent. Something new introduced, someone who was not there in the previous chapters. Now the serpent. And the word serpent, uh, like many words in the uh, Bible, they, this is the word shining one. It's not a word snake, which we have here. And the problem with these words is that they have two meanings. So, for example, if you look at the word seraphim, seraphim in, uh, in Isaiah chapter 6, the seraphim were surrounding the throne of God. That word means the burning ones, the ones who are uh, burning in holiness with God. And, uh, but, of course, that word has other meanings. Hebrew is quite common in this way. And it also means snakes because of the burning bite from a snake. But that's a totally different meaning, but the same word. And you have the same here in this chapter 3 of, um, uh, of Genesis. And it's very remarkable and very important to realize that words in Hebrew do have more than one meaning. And uh, it's like the word Caleb can mean um, courageous, but it also means dog. <laughs> and uh, Goliath said, am I just a dog? Am I just a Caleb? <laughs> That's the very same word he used. Then this is very common in the Hebrew language. So you, when you read a word, you, you have to know what, what is the word meaning. It's like ruach. We've already met ruach, the spirit of the day and the wind. The, which one does it mean? And you have to make a choice and uh, try and discern what it means. Of course, here the choice has been made for as many years ago by translators who said, oh, it means a, a snake. I don't believe it does, or it could do, and you're allowed to disagree with me because none of us in the end can know. Only God, we weren't there, only God knows really what, what was happening. But the word shining one, it, it refers really, in, in my mind, to a, a, an angel of light. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians, I think it's chapter 10 or 11, that Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. He was an angel. And one thing is certain, that he had uh, arms and legs, because we know that by the end of this conversation and by the end of this chapter, he is paraplegic. He cannot walk. And uh, I think of him in a wheelchair. When you think of Satan, you must think of him in a wheelchair. And uh, probably had wings, and he was... He had his wings clipped as well by the end of this. But whatever his form, that was changing. God was changing his form through this event. 
Satan was already fallen. We don't know anything about that previously. We can find more details about his fall in, in Isaiah chapter 14 and in um, Ezekiel chapter 28, when it tells us about the anointed cherub who was in the Garden of Eden and walking among the stones of fire until iniquity was found in him. And then we find also that um, in Isaiah chapter 14, it says, that he wanted to make his throne above the throne of God. In Ezekiel, it talks about him saying, I am God. And uh, he wanted to be above God. He didn't want to just to be a, a powerful being submitted to God. He wanted to be above God, equal to God at least, uh, but above God, it says in, in um, uh, Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28, where it tells a little details about Satan. The other thing we know about Satan is, of course, his, his name. He is called the serpent, the shining one. In, um, uh, in uh, Hebrew, the word Satan is not, again, limited to Satan. It is a word that actually just means enemy. He is the enemy. And uh, we find it used by ordinary people who are enemies. So enemies of David, that's the word Satan. And then we find another word is the word diabolos, which means a slanderer or a gossip. And it comes from two words meaning dia through and bolos, spear through or pierce through. A gossip is somebody going around stabbing people, spearing people. Uh, and arrows or bullets come out of the tongue. I remember someone describing a gossip, uh, somebody who had a mouth, they said he has a mouth like a machine gun <laughs> and uh, destructive and murderous like a machine gun. We also know that the, the, the Jesus said of him, he is um, a liar from the beginning and a murderer and uh, there is no truth in him. And we know his name is Apollyon. He is the destroyer. This terrible being, this spirit being, this mighty angel, but now a fallen being and coming to speak to the human race. Um, it is possible that his, uh, his whole destiny was linked with the human race. It says in uh, Hebrews chapter 1, it says that of angels, are they not ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them who shall be heirs of salvation? So we could Imagine that the, the angels were meant to serve us right from the beginning. And they hated this, or at least some of them did, a third of them did. If we take some of the scriptures to mean a third of the angels fell. Um, so here we've got this being coming to the human race. And he, he doesn't want to serve humanity. He wants to destroy God's plan for humanity. And yet the Bible says God makes all things work together for good. And we know that even Satan, God allowed him to speak here in this. He allowed him to tempt the human race. And that was simply part of what it means to be human, that we must make a moral choice. We've already seen that when we looked at the image of God in man. We have moral choice. And even if there had been no Satan, just to, in the same way, we would have had the same choice and the same need to keep our souls right in obedience to God. Um, but here we have the fact that God allowed Satan to tempt the human race. Why? Well, you can read books, you can find out what people say, but in the end, we just know that God has a plan and Somehow he allowed this to happen. Uh, very difficult to say much more, but we know that all things will work together for good. So he allowed him to speak. And as I said, he only spoke um, 44 words. The power of the word, the power of just a few words is incredible. And the power we have to hurt one another, the power we have to wreak havoc with people's lives. And you meet people who were um, 
deeply damaged by one phrase or word spoken by a sibling uh, uh, in, in, the, in the home or by a parent, um, something that sticks and works and continues working. One phrase, we are to pray that our words will be wholesome and good to one another. And by God's grace, there is also power in the word to heal and to, to bring forgiveness and life and light. It's, uh, uh, this is the word he's spoken. We've, we've already read it. And uh, this, this word, what, what does the word of Satan do? What happens in these 44 words? It's quite amazing what is contained in those 44 words. Let me bring a few things out. Of course, the big thing is, is, that is happening is that he is maligning God's character and God's motives. And uh, thank God the Bible doesn't quote the devil very often. Uh, it, uh, it's been uh, remarked often, and uh, I'm not the first one to notice it, but the, the devil only is uh, quoted three times in the whole of Scripture. That's here in Job chapter 1 and 2, and then in the beginning of the Gospels, in the temptations in the wilderness. That is the only occasion, three occasions in the whole of Scripture when he's allowed to speak. And if you like, God doesn't give him much publicity space. So here we've got these, these words. And he, as I've said, he maligns God's character. And he, he begins by saying, has God? He's speculating, has God? And he's getting the woman to Eve to enter in to to speculative thinking he's getting into her mind because this is where all sin begins it may be difficult for us to grasp at it quickly but it is true that the center and source of all sin all sin is in the mind and it's the mind that goes wrong later on the mind wants to get back once sin is unleashed upon us the mind may get back the mind is a doorway, and we are to keep our minds. And uh, she opened the doorway of her mind to receive this word of Satan and to speculate about it. And we are to guard our minds and guard what we think. And uh, we are not to allow anything of Satan to get in. Um, just yesterday, uh, we were listening to something by Ravi Zacharias, and uh, he talked about a a surgeon who uh, was terrified because he'd op operated on a man and uh, as he was um, working with his heart he, he realized he got a paper cut on his hand and he thought the man probably had AIDS the man, uh, HIV positive the man he was working on and just a paper cut could have allowed the virus to spread into his body and the, the, the truth is just a paper cut, just a word, just a small thing, and it can wreak havoc in our lives. And it's like a seed. If I hold an acorn in my hand, it's just a seed. It's so tiny, but it can become a forest. And as we know, what happened in this chapter has unleashed terrible events upon the whole of the human race that all the things we can see that have gone wrong the, wrong, the murders, the pride, the wars, the, the genocides, the holocaust, uh, there's so much that's gone wrong in the human race, it all started here. It was a, a little door opened, but when, you, when he gets his foot in the door, when sin came into the human race, it wreaked havoc. And we must remember that Satan's plan to destroy the human race was to plant a seed in us. The seed of Satan is his word and it is sin. And sin came into the human race through one man. It wasn't created by Adam. It was formed in Satan and came into the human race. It is an invading force. It is, an in, it is something that has joined itself into us like a virus has joined in, uh, joins in a body and becomes living in that body and is very difficult to separate out, as we can see with the current virus situation. Very hard to get it out. No cure known among men. Nothing will get it out. The virus is in the human race. How to separate that virus out? And they're, they're trying to find a vaccine to increase the resistance against that vaccine. 
but once the vaccine is the, the, once the virus is in it's very difficult to stop it well, well thank god there's the blood of christ that can destroy the virus of sin in the human heart and remove it out of our life and remove it from the the web of our life the stain can be gone by the blood of jesus and the blood of jesus alone so we we've seen he puts up this uh, word he puts God's word up for negative discussion and then he says God knows he is deceiving you God is hiding something from you um, God knows something and Satan knows what more about God this is what he's pretending he's saying God is uh, he's 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 maligning God's character to us so we've got here the thought that um, God's word is God really serious about what he's saying this is what he's trying to introduce things about God's character and then God is deceiving you he, he's trying to keep something back from you God has selfish motives he doesn't want you to become like him and uh, then the other thing that he says about God's character he contradicts God's word and says you shall not die God isn't that strict God isn't severe. There are no um, serious consequences from your actions. And let's not get too uh, harsh on people. Let's not be too severe. Come on, let's. This is a modern world. We don't have the death penalty. We're going to try and reform everything, make everything smooth over. There's no heavy consequences anymore. This is the word of Satan. Unfortunately, there is a terrible power of evil. And God is severe against evil. And uh, he, he, this is the maligning of God's character. And um, so then we come to the fact that Eve entertained this and was deceived. She believed the lies about God. Um, the source of all trouble was in her head. She, uh, in, her, in her thoughts, ideas, and she allowed it to enter and it, and this is the problem of when when unbelief comes in unbelief is based on a wrong idea of god god is not good this is the lie of satan god is not loving god is not holy and strict and severe with sin all these thoughts are mixed up in these words of satan and once they have come into our lives we are now in a state of unbelief about God. We are believing wrong things about God. She didn't stop believing that there was a God, but she began to believe wrong things about God. It isn't only that we believe in God, it is that we believe the right things about God. And the universe is built upon one simple fact. The foundation of the universe is the character of God. And the character of God is that God is good, God is love, God is holy, and these are the foundations of the universe. If, if that changes, if that were to change, the universe would implode. It's, it's based upon that. There would be no, uh, there'd be no faithfulness to build on. There'd be nothing. The word of God would not be reliable. Immediately, we're lost. If God is not good, if God has an ulterior motive to to do anything bad to us we're lost at that moment and uh, so the universe is built on god's unchanging love and faithfulness and my inner universe my mind my life is built on my faith in god's unchanging love and faithfulness we are weak when we think god is not reliable we stop praying when we think that god won't answer our prayers this is the lie of Satan, and this is why Jesus came, the Word of God made flesh. The Word of God come to us to declare to us in human form what God is like, and to declare it also in sermons and words and conversations. Jesus was the Word of God to declare to us. But the most powerful word that Jesus spoke was when he was crucified. And on the cross, the word of the cross, it's called the word of the cross that contradicts everything Satan has said. And it's the action that proves above everything else that God is love. 
I am connected with the truth that God is love when I believe it. Eve was disconnected when she believed Satan's lie about God. And I am reconnected with God's work, nature and life when I believe the word of God, when I believe the word of the cross, when I believe that Jesus is the true manifestation of God. He is the son of the father. And so it reached her. It was in spec speculation. She began to think about all these things that she was hearing. Maybe God is trying to keep something back from me. Maybe God's got God's ways are hemming me in and stopping me having enjoyment and pleasure and i need to get this uh this 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 way whatever her thought processes at some point here in this uh, this event it reached her will and the will is the key thing to the door opening it was bad enough that she was speculating it was bad enough that she was entering into the possibility that what satan was saying was true but now she had got to the point where she acted, and that is the door opening. And uh, she opens her mouth, picks the fruit, and eats it and swallows it. It's the seed. And remember, in fruit, there are seeds. Even when you eat a banana, you may not notice it, but there's little black dots in the banana. They're seeds. I don't know if they can really be cultivated into a plant, but they, yeah, they can because I've got the, I've got the, bio, the, the, the zoology and biology expert here. They can be, they grow into a banana seed, can grow into a, a banana tree. And this is the problem that when we eat, when we sin and our will is open, what we're actually receiving is not, what we're doing is not just a neutral action. We are interacting with seed power now thank god when we interact with the bible and god and the spirit we are also interacting with seed power in fact the bible says that jesus christ himself is god's seed and uh, it's very powerful the seed of god so the action she her action and i'm going to use a word now i'm going to call it a sacramental action what do i mean by that what by what i mean is that the fruit, what was it? An apple tree? What well, it doesn't really matter what it was, because it was a symbolic action. The truth was she should have um, resisted this and not done it. Um, but the action was the disobedience. And it was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil by experience. She wanted to go, I, I believe personally that God had placed that tree there, um, and that there would have been a day when God would have allowed them to eat it. And um, I remember a story of a, um, a girl who went to stay with her aunt, and there was a path into the, into the orchard, and, and, and um, her aunt said, don't go down that path, whatever you do. But she didn't explain why. <laughs> so what happened? She went down the path, and uh, she went there, and... Uh, she was looking around and she disturbed a wasp's nest. There was a wasp's nest down the path. And uh, then she found out why. And of course, the rest of the story you can imagine. But the, um, the action here was sacramental. It was symbolical. And she, she, she went down the path of self-realization and disobedience. And what happened? Well, we'll see what happened in a moment. But she died. That's the key thing. Now, the point I want to make is that baptism and communion can also be sacramental acts. They are not always sacramental acts because they must be accompanied by obedience, which is more than the act itself. The water doesn't have power to do anything. And when we eat the, 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 the bread and drink the cup, it has no power. It's not the body and blood of Jesus Christ. But when we do these things with faith, then they are sacramental. And it's the faith that changes. It's not the water, not the bread, not the wine. It's the, it's the presence of God. And uh, we need to do these things that God has given to us by faith. And um, so she died. Um, when we think of this, it said, you will not die. But she died. She didn't die physically. The, the Holy Spirit departed, the, the absence of the Holy Spirit. He's the spirit of life. The spirit departed, that is death. 
and the knowledge of God became a distant memory. Fear became the new reality. Maybe she had a rush of pleasure as she ate this fruit, and wow, that's amazing, but the pleasure was mixed with a terrible feeling of, of, of something lost in the heart, and as Graham said, the peace of God was lost. And she was changing her life, her spiritual world was changing. And uh, she was losing this place in her heart. She was the temple of God. We said already the whole universe is a temple for God. But a human being is a temple for God. And now the glory had departed from the temple and she died. She continued to live, but it was a living death. People talk of a living hell. And she was a li living a living death. And she continued to live, but it was like death. She, and remember, this change, these events were all visible on her face. The mixture of feelings of joy and pain and sorrow coming in and all these things in a, mixed on, on her face. And, and somehow it tells us that um, Adam was watching silent, passive, not deceived, with some extra information. Remember, he is the one who had taught Eve the word of God. Eve had not heard God speak all those instructions because some of those instructions were spoken before Eve was created. She, he was the one who had taught Eve what she knew. And she, when she quoted um, God, she was quoting what Adam had said God had said. And he is silent. He is passive. He is observing. He is attracted. He is experimenting. He, is he wants to see. He is, he is not to blame because he is he's just watching. But the thing is, there is this terrible origin of sin in the passivity of Adam. Now, in a moment, he's going to eat it. But before he ate it, he allowed Eve. He did nothing. He did, there was no, and you have this in the New Testament. You have Ananias and Sapphira. Maybe Ananias said, "Let's keep some of the money, but let's not tell everybody that we've kept the money. Let's just say we've given everything." And Sapphira should have said, "No." She should have rebuked her husband and said, "No, I'm not going to do that." And. Uh, but they agreed. And remember what Peter said to them, have you agreed together? And uh, this agreement came because Adam was silent and passive. And uh, there is no greater darkness that can come than when people do nothing, when we stop praying, when we stop act, being active spiritually. It doesn't mean that we are to strain and strive, but it does mean we are to seek fellowship and the aid of the Holy Spirit to make us active spiritual people. We are to reach out because there is a great future ahead of us. But if we sit back in absolute passivity, that is a crime. It is a sin. And it's here in this chapter. Adam, silent, passive, inactive. We need challenge to excellence, moral excellence spiritual excellence and we must be ready to challenge one another not necessarily by preaching to one another don't go and tell somebody off that's not what we're talking about but we need to challenge one another by the way we live by the choices we make by the things we do we need challenge and if we are living with, with no man is an island we are going to influence other people around us we need challenge and we need to respond to the challenge of god we already said the sacramental work of, of baptism uh, and, and communion. Baptism is a one-off. Communion is a continuant. But the thing about those things is that they are the opposite of eating the fruit. There is self-denial. There is dying to self. It's not self-realization. It is not, it's not self being promoted. It's not self being on the throne. It is the denial of self. We need moral and spiritual excellence, and you need to challenge yourself.
to go on and not to be waylaid and not just to do nothing and not let things dumb down and not let things dilute, but to rise up in your heart. Well, we've reached the, the I think we've said enough today. We, we will look at it another time because the creation, of course, was cursed, pain, sorrow, physical death, a blighted world, their body changed, decay came in, and, uh, and so on. And the man fearful of God, hiding, running away, hiding among the trees, and, um, and, and knowing things that he didn't know from God. I love this word that God said to him, who told you that? Where did you learn that? And man beginning to learn things from his own mind rather than from the mind of God. And a uh, whole th disaster comes upon. Now, we've seen the way down. We've seen the way of re speculating, receiving the word, and um, uh, the lies of Satan, the, the barrier between man and God. Then the action leading to action that is wrong, and a door opened, and disaster. But then let's put it in reverse. Let's take the word of Jesus Christ. Let's take the word of the cross. Let's deny ourselves. Let's take action and repent and humble ourselves and eat the bread of life because the tree of life is in this on this planet it was planted on this planet by Jesus Christ when he died on the cross the tree of life is the cross and we can eat the fruit of the tree of life and live forever but this with this extra power in the tree of life that there is cleansing from sin there is forgiveness from sin and there is cleansing and we can be restored to fellowship with God we can have life. They had bios, bios, biological life. That continued, but it was a living death. We will have eternal life as we eat of that fruit. It's a quality of life. It's the knowledge, the true knowledge of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's pray, shall we? Let's pray. Father, I praise you that you, you there's nothing here in these accounts that speaks of you as anything but loving and broken over their actions and persistent in love and immediate in your reaching out to them. And you do the same to every sinner. You do the same to every human being. Mm. To reach out and restore is your plan and your heart. I praise you for your character. You are good. You are perfect. You are loving. You are kind. Mm. Jesus Christ, I worship you. And I come to eat and drink of who you are, to deny myself and to open my will, that you be my life now and forever. Amen. 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 Father, we do thank you for our word, your word to our hearts, Lord. We thank you for constantly bringing challenge to us, Lord, in our hearts, constantly bringing choices where we can choose to follow ourselves, Lord, towards self-realization or follow you towards Christ-realization in our lives, Lord. And we want to be a people that grow into the measure and stature and fullness of your Son. We want to be a people, Lord, who exhibit his qualities, Lord, and not the qualities that were doomed in sin and forged in in wrong headedness wrong thinking and wrong choices father we thank you we love you lord this morning we thank you for your kindness to us as a father lord who brings lord the truth to us again and again patiently lord waiting for us to make those choices waiting for us lord to choose you thank you lord that we can do that lord this morning again amen